Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Izzy Greenberg. I run the Middlesex Coalition for Children. These calls are sponsored by an early childhood partnership of four organizations, Middlesex Coalition for Children, Connecticut Association for Human Services, Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance, and CSEA SEIU. Um, we've got some great stuff happening this morning, so I'm glad you're all here. Uh, we are gonna start out with the Women's Business Development Council, um, and they're gonna update us on the technology business needs survey. Um, and then after that, we've got Commissioner Bai here who has a million updates um, for you all, the Blue Ribbon Panel Legislative Session, Care for Kids, Payments, Licensing, it goes on and on. Um, and so I hope, um, I hope folks have a little bit of time and attention this morning because we've got a packed morning. So I'm gonna start by turning it over to um, Louise Lisboa and Linda Facto, who are um, both here from Women's Business Development Council. So thank you so much to both of you and um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Izzy. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. So I am here to talk to you about the Child Care Technology Business Needs Survey for the child care industry that we release in partnership with the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood, or OEC, and the United Way of Connecticut Staff Family Child Care Network Hub and 211. So this survey is really important. I know you guys get hit with a lot of surveys and I am grateful for all the time you spend taking them. And I hear the frustrations that there are so many, but we are here again, we are trying to get data in partnership with OEC to help inform the blue ribbon panel work to understand how many slots are out there? What is the demand for childcare? What does the supply look like? So you guys can help give us that data. We ask about your childcare operations, how many employees do you have? And also the biggest part of this survey is to understand how you use technology in your childcare program. So uh, the purpose of that is to understand how are we gonna automate childcare and help save you time and money so that you are not doing so many of those day-to-day -day tasks. How can it be done by software? So that is the purpose of the survey. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for a moment. So this is a survey. You guys might have seen it come out in the last week or two weeks, okay, from WBBC or 211, okay? So if you have taken it already, thank you so much. If you have not taken it, please, please, please do so before July 23rd. So the survey is available in English and in Spanish, and you can change that right at the top right corner, and you can change it to Spanish if that is your preferred language, okay? The survey is available to take on a computer, a smartphone, or a tablet or iPad. So whatever is easiest for you, you can do it. It is a little bit of a longer survey, but we do encourage you to try to finish it at one time if you can. If you cannot, that is okay. As long as you're using the same computer or phone or web browser, you can come back to that survey and finish it when you need to. So this is what the survey will look like. You'll just answer a couple of questions on who you are, help us get to know you, where are you located, I just have some sample data in there. You can choose if you're part of a business network or group, like if you're part of the union, for example, you might mark that off. Or if you are a WBDC client, or if you are part of a staff family childcare network, you can mark off multiple answers. And then we're going to ask you a little bit about your business operations. Okay, so how many employees do you have? How does your program operate? How many children do you currently have enrolled? And also something important here that I'll call out is what is the maximum number of children you would like to have enrolled in your program? Okay, so if you have let's say six currently, but you want to get to nine and you're hoping to fill that school-age children's slots, you're going to put nine total children here. Thanks. 
Luis, would you um, would you be able to make that f full screen? Folks are seeing the, the backgrounds more than they're seeing the survey. Is that oh, possible? Okay, hold on one second. Let me give that a shot. I think probably on mobile is my guess. I think it actually three helps. at the right, correct? Uh, should be. And so if you guys, if you try it again, for anyone who's on a mobile device, it may help uh, literally to just use your finger to scroll across. It may, the, it was to the left. The survey was to the left. So just try again, Louise, and maybe folks can, can do that and it may help. Yeah, I'll try to make that bigger. Unfortunately, I can't get rid of the imagery on the right. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. I can see the survey though. So. Yeah. Great. So this is that example. Um, so here we're trying to understand where does your program hope to be? Okay. The next sets of questions that you're going to see are going to be around how do you run your business? And also what technology do you use in your business? Uh, I won't keep going through, but the other parts are about child care management software. Okay. So child care management software, if you use it, fantastic. You can take the survey. If you don't use it, that's okay. You can still take the survey. For those that use the software, such as Hi Mama or ProCare or Brightwheel, we want to understand how do you use it and how has it helped your business or what has been challenging about it. For those that haven't used child care management software, we want to understand how much time are you spending on your business operations, communicating with families, taking attendance, managing your staff, anything like that, okay? And the purpose of that is to help the state understand what does the industry look like and be able to make investments in technology and hopefully automation software and supports and assistance to go along with that. Okay, all the data is confidential. At the very end of the survey, we do ask you to provide contact information and your OEC license number. That is optional, okay? You don't have to provide it, but we highly encourage you to do so. So we just have better quality data and we can try to avoid people answering the survey multiple times. So if you're willing, we would really appreciate it. Are any questions coming in about the survey? I don't think we have any except that folks are looking for the link to the survey. Okay, beautiful. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that link in right now. Give me one second. And it did show up on the on the iPad once. We got to work. Fantastic. So I've gone ahead and pasted the link to the survey in the chat. And if we have any child care centers or multi-site programs on this call, please go ahead and only take the survey once for one of your locations. All right. Great. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, Linda. And uh, this is really terrific. And we're so appreciative of you being here just to describe this a little bit and help folks understand its importance. Thank you. All right. Uh, switching next to uh, Commissioner Bai. Let's see here. Um, as a reminder to everyone, uh, the chat is a great spot for you all to share information with each other or any tech needs. But if you have questions for the commissioner, Q&A is the spot for that, and I would request that you please wait <laughs> till closer to the end to put your questions in in case they are answered, because it's really hard for me to wade through 60 questions when some of them have already been answered, and um, that would really help me out. Also, any folks who are here from the Office of Early Childhood or any of our um, other, other panelists, you're welcome to uh, go into the Q&A. And if there are things you can answer in writing, please do so. That, that also helps me to just ask Commissioner By the things that um, are necessary for her to answer verbally. So, okay, Commissioner, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, nice to see everybody. I hope you all had a good weekend. It was a little steamy. And certainly this morning was an adventure for me getting to work uh, with all the flooding. So uh, I hope that uh, you're all safe and that your basements are dry. Uh, happy to be here. 
Um, I'm going to do a few things today. I'm going to start by giving an overview of the legislative session because there were a good number of items um, that passed. And then I'll take some questions there. And then I was going to um, give an update on where we are with the Blue Ribbon Panel and ways that you can give us feedback. Um, was going to talk about Care for Kids payments as there's been a delay there. And then I've had some questions coming in about licensing uh, regulations uh, changes that are um, we're taking feedback for now. Uh, and then uh, also, if there's time, talk about the uh, final round of um, American Rescue dollars going out uh, for the highest in the highest need communities. So I'll start and I'll share my screen. Um, a big thank you to you all for your advocacy this session. Um, you made a difference and it was a good session uh, for early childhood. I think, you know, I always like to say uh, we're making positive differences, but still uh, it's not all sufficient. It's not what we need. And that's why we have the Blue Ribbon Panel. And Louise, thank you for that request on the survey. Because one thing we're finding is that we think we have good information about what's out there and where the kids are and how many kids people want and how many are enrolled. Um, but in fact, we don't. And so we think a survey like this will help. And I know there've been other surveys, as Louise said, and you're sick of them. But part of the reason there are so many surveys is we don't have the information technology system that we need for early childhood in the state. And that will certainly be one of the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Panel but the Blue Rim panel is now making decisions without that information. So this information will help us understand even the technology infrastructure um, is a core item for us because some of the solutions are technology based. And if we don't understand the technology you have, we can't, we can't make the recommendations as strongly. Um, so appreciate you filling that out. Um, but in terms of the uh, legislative session, a big thank you to Maggie Adair, who put together uh, this PowerPoint for me to walk you through. Um, one of the things I'm getting a lot of questions about is a fund that's been established, an early childhood fund that's at the office of the state comptroller. And um, I think this is, uh, this is something that came from the legislative side. Um, but the idea is, I believe, to set up a fund, something like New Mexico did. Um, so there is a separate fund for early childhood in the case that there are there's philanthropy or business or government funds um, to support early childhood ads. So uh, that that got through that there's no money in it, uh, but there is now a fund established. Uh, the other uh, part of that was it asked. Uh, for the uh, for the OEC to report to the legislature representation uh, rep recommendations about how to use that early childhood education fund. So um, and see how it also aligns with blue ribbon panel on child care recommendations. Um, another big change is that in the budget, uh, the care for kids rates uh, were increased by 11% each year for three years. Um, so uh, those will be changes in payments, and I know that changes some of your payment structure. So um, over the next three years, that will increase. Um, in addition, uh, the governor wanted to add funding in 2024 for the American Rescue with American Rescue Plan dollars um, to uh, maintain enrollments in the uh, Care for Kids system. Um, another new thing is uh, I think. You'll be able, we'll be working more closely with DCF um, and child care payments. I know many of you have had challenges with payments from DCF, and we've been looking for a way to collaborate more. And so uh, OEC now has a protective services category that prioritizes children in the foster care system, and OEC will be making payments for those children, also um, children in that system who are adopted and children who are homeless. Um, and uh, meet the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness, which is the same as the public school. Um, so those were some changes to care for kids. Um, the rate uh, for school readiness in fiscal year 25 will move to 10,500 per child from 89-24. Um, 
And uh, we have been having, uh, I think, some really great pilots uh, trying to expand the workforce and uh, the budget for two years. There's two and a half million a year uh, to be used to continue to fund those workforce pipeline projects. Um, so we're working on finding that. Uh, it just basically makes Smart Start a permanent funding stream. Um, it, it also, the budget allotted $2 million for two years um, to do outreach to parents because uh, there are concerns among legislators that parents aren't aware of all the early childhood services that are available to them. And that has an impact on their kindergarten, you know, when they're ready for kindergarten, et cetera. And so we'll be working with the local early childhood collaboratives on that. Um, and it also, which is really super exciting for us is it supports a staff position for the parent cabinet and it establishes a parent cabinet in statute. Um, the governor also uh, had a proposal that was passed to give a tax credit of 25% to businesses that um, have childcare related expenditures. That includes um, an onsite childcare center subsidies um, to support uh, children's enrollment in community based childcare settings. Uh, and then uh, there was a slight increase in funding to even start in 2Gen. And uh, this doesn't affect child care providers as much, but it's very important uh, that we uh, continue with additional funding for birth to three while we work on the cost of care analysis. Um, some other changes, I already talked about the first two. Um, there were some changes in the uh, EpiPen. Uh, basically, the child care programs can am administer the EpiPen uh, without uh, written authorization um, of a parent. So that was because there are sometimes emergencies and uh, they will not be held responsible um, if they do, if they do uh, use that. Um, in technical change, early childhood councils will be changed to local early childhood collaboratives. Um, we also made uh, some changes that allow communities to shift school readiness spaces to serve infants and toddlers, much like CDCs do now. Sometimes they ask for shifts, child daycare programs. Um, and child uh, school readiness grant awards will move from annually to every two years. Uh, and uh, I hate to just read a PowerPoint, but I'm just making sure I cover, uh, provide any explanations here. Um, oh, we deleted language that required that any school readiness or child daycare rate increase be used exclusively for staff salaries. That language was put in there when we added $100 a kid uh, to the rate. And now there have been significant increases. And um, this is really just an accounting uh, practice for programs because most money goes to salaries anyway. So it seemed like something auditors were asking about and we were required to ask about when in fact, uh, most of the funds are going to salaries. So that was taken out. Uh, I've already mentioned the cabinet. Um, another one that really impacts your day to day um, that OEC has opposed, but um, it's been coming for a while, I believe, or there's certainly been um, hearings about this for a decade. Uh, is a change as a kindergarten entry age from January to September. I think the big challenge for you all in this one is rather than give two years notice, which would allow the system to adapt, uh, there's just one year notice. So um, many of you have enrolled children who are two years and nine months in September. And uh, we are putting out a, a, today is a joint statement from SDE and OEC. And that statement is going to urge you to honor those commitments to the families who've enrolled in your program um, because families have been planning. Um, and also uh, because they have changed the date of kindergarten start, but we're not urging you uh, to change the date of when you accept children. You know, we're, we're, we think whenever kids can start preschool, that's a good thing. Um, Okay, uh, the other one, which we also have significant concerns about, 
is uh, changing some of the teacher certification related to early childhood ed. Um, uh, but it is supposed to be, it, it was designed to be a waiver process for a year and it ended up being two. Um, and then we, we do have concerns about um, the early childhood special ed degree um, being changed uh, because the pre-K to three and one to six endorsements really protect the early childhood workforce pipeline in higher ed institutions. Um, so this change is going to be a little difficult, uh, I think, for our pipeline, but uh, they were meant to be temporary, and I fully expect that the Blue Ribbon Panel will have recommendations, and SDE and we have been working together on this. So I see this as a temporary fix because of some of the staffing concerns in public schools, which are very real. So uh, it's not perfect, but uh, we'll continue to work with SDE and our legislators on it. I think everybody has the best of intentions of trying to meet the needs of early childhood and trying to meet the needs in public schools. At OEC, our concern is protecting early, high quality early childhood educator practice, which is different than elementary practice, um, but obviously the two meet. Other um, legislative highlights, uh, really great progress and hard work done um, to uh, protect group child care homes um, from zoning. There are a lot of zoning challenges for them. And I know all our kin and, and other groups have been working on this uh, for several years uh, and did a super job uh, compromising this year and getting this through. I think it will help our group homes and help the development of more group homes. The other thing we're really excited about, which I don't get to talk to you all about very often, but we've spent the past two years developing a universal nurse home visiting program to bring families those early childhood supports and health supports uh, prenatally and right after birth. So in Bridgeport, uh, we're, we have a contract with Bridgeport Hospital and OEC is launching a universal nurse home visiting program. Um, very shortly, uh, I think we started to hire community health workers. And we've been studying Norwich as the next community to, to move to. So that's exciting, uh, really exciting. Um, there's some really good data that early, early intervention, just helping parents understand all their babies can do right at first has long-term impacts. Um, and it also addresses some of the equity and health outcomes for mothers post-birth. Post um, the next one we talked about already. So those are the legislative updates. And I'm happy to answer questions about that now. And I think Maggie might be on in case I don't know, and Elaine is on. So I have a couple of backups, some really strong backups if I can't answer a question. The uh, kindergarten start age is the is the thing on people's minds. Um, so the first question is, will there be guidance related to children enrolled at 2.9 who will now be in preschool for three years due to the kindergarten entry date change? Yeah, our guidance is that we are not discouraging families from enrolling at two years, nine months. It may mean they have three years of program if they have a fall birthday. But um, our language, I think, in the memo says we do not discourage programs from enrolling children at two years, nine months. Our licensing regulations are going to stay the same. I mean, programs need to make decisions around space, et cetera. Um, and I know there are a lot of preschools that you know don't have extra space, but our data shows there are um, three and four year old programs that do have space. So, you know, people need to make their own decisions at a level, but we are not discouraging that. Okay. Will there be a waiver provided for children to enter kindergarten at four? I've already received questions from parents. Uh, yes, there was a uh, language put in right at the end because of concerns about this bill um, to allow parents a waiver process. But we don't know what that waiver process is. It could be district to district. And, you know, the guide that OEC and other districts have been using is the age of the child. Um, there is no like perfect developmental screening for young children. We know that when it comes to tests and measurements for young children in general, 
there are not valid and reliable assessments uh, of, of young children. And so districts are asking the same questions. Parents are allowed to wave in, but I think it's up to the district to decide. Okay. Um, also a reminder to folks, um, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. If you can put those in the Q&A, makes it a lot easier for me. Um, okay, let's see. Um, there's a couple of statements here. I'm in favor of the change in age. However, as Commissioner By states, one year is not enough. We've seen, uh, we have seven children going into our forest class who will not be eligible for kindergarten as expected when they enrolled. We do not have room for those seven children to stay for another year since group size of threes is 16 and fours is 17. So, you know, folks are going to have some difficult stuff coming up. Uh, in, yeah, in and we're happy to work with programs like there may be license modifications or program modifications. I mean, we really promote mixed age classrooms and we think we're going to need to be providing additional professional development over the next 12 months uh, to help programs um, either feel comfortable with mixed age because, you know, it would even if programs have pre-K three, pre-K four, now the pre-K four could easily be pre-K four and pre-K five and We've always held if kids aren't ready for kindergarten, they're ready for preschool. And ideally we want them to stay with programs that the parents trust. And I know there are programs that say, nope, people come for two years and OEC has had policies in the past that uh, encourage that. But um, we are working hard on trying to um, uh, provide professional development on this, and we will be working on guidance as well. Okay. Will it be up to local school readiness programs to make determinations about funding infant and toddler spots? Yes, those will be community-based decisions um, in Connecticut. Okay. With, uh, with families still eligible, will families still be eligible for school readiness slots in their children's third year of pre-K over the age of five? Um, yes, I mean, the idea is if the kids are not eligible for kindergarten, they're eligible for school readiness funding. So yes, um, and again, programs need to think about space and communities about allocations. You know, we just passed this infant toddler change at the same time that the kindergarten age is going to put strain on preschool age. So it's gonna take some strong community planning um, to make sure this all works. How did the change in kindergarten entry go through without input from the early childhood community? And <laughs> to be clear, there's been a lot of comments over the years. So um, I just wanna say that as you go and answer your question. <laughs> well, um, it was in a bill and OEC testified against it. Um, because of concerns, because a third of the kids will now not have access to kindergarten. Um, so we, we expressed our concerns that until the state had universal preschool access, whether that's in community-based or school-based settings, um, we were concerned that there'd be about 10,000 kids, you know, sort of left out uh, somehow not getting what they need. Um, so, and, and you figure uh, we know only 71% of kids have access to preschool before kindergarten. So now that 20 not, those 29% of children are gonna have nothing for a whole other year if the parents can't access uh, preschool because they can't afford it or they can't get the kids there. It's easy to forget that transportation is a huge challenge for many families um, in Connecticut, uh, getting kids to programs. Um, so there were opportunities for public comment at that hearing, and maybe people didn't know about that, um, but uh, there was, there definitely was, the legislature definitely gave opportunity for public comment, and to your point, Izzy, there have been, you know, this is driven a, a lot of it by kindergarten teachers and the CEA, um, who are saying, you know, we're getting four and a half year olds and six and a half year olds, because families that can't afford to hold their kids back often do, so it's a problem created by both ends of the spectrum, but I'm afraid the people that will be disproportionately impacted are folks who can't afford early childhood ed. So I think we all, it's incumbent on us to work, continue to work like you all have been to expand access to early childhood experiences for kids, because we know we're not reaching everyone. 
Yeah, and, and let me just say, this is a fantastic opportunity to get your parents involved in the advocacy work that we've all been yeah. doing, right? Yeah. So use this, <laughs> you know, if, if parents are struggling with this difference, get them involved, you know, get them involved in our advocacy efforts. Uh, because now if this has passed, the thing to fight for is more funding in this system so that parents have relief. Um, and so obviously that our educators are earning more. So, you know, this is, this is the time for that. Um, let's not let that go to waste. Okay. Um, the waiver process, if not well considered, will definitely have a good likelihood of discriminating against children with special needs. Will guidance be provided about this to the districts? Um, yes. Uh, and, and again, we're working closely with SDE. They too opposed this legislation when it came out. Um, I, this is the biggest concern I have is the children with special needs, because uh, if any of you on the call are parents of children with special needs, you know that many districts have half day, part week, preschool supports, uh, special education supports. So birth to three offers in home at child care center, the supports work for working families, then working families hit public preschool for the special education needs. And it's much more challenging. Some of them have to leave the workforce. And then now at least they could, as soon as their child turned four and three quarters, they could enter kindergarten and have transportation and school day, school year coverage. And now those a third of those families will wait a whole other year before they have the kindergarten coverage. Um, so I think, I think we're gonna work really closely with SDE and local districts because, um, it's difficult when local districts have those part week programs, um, part time, part week, and families can't get services other ways. And the other option is just, should we be thinking about, and we haven't talked about this, but um, should we be thinking about parents having the option of a birth to five system where those special education services could be offered like they are in birth to three, right up until kindergarten? Uh, this is a question that's come up in the past. Um, but what's going on now is not working for many families. We're hearing in our parent survey and the Blue Ribbon panel, this comes up as a big major challenge. Parents that have children with special needs have major challenges finding childcare. Um, and I'm sharing, Maggie Adair had um, posted a um, link to a story in the current today, but I think she just made it to the host and panelists. So I just made it available to everyone. Um, that's very easy to do. <laughs> um, so that's just, that's in there. Um, okay, that's in the chat now if folks wanna read it. Um, okay, since the school readiness preschool amount and the infant and toddler rate aren't equal, will OEC increase a school readiness grant if there is a switch in funding category? Um, the way it's, it's structured now and it's it's how it's sort of how it happens with Head Start and with child daycare is the communities have a certain amount of funding. So if you shifted some to infants and toddlers, um, you'd serve fewer children because uh, 13 five is the infant toddler rate and 10 five is the preschool rate. Okay. Uh, my center has decided to open a young threes classroom that's keeping the toddler ratio, giving them the small class size they still need, but we'll be doing three-year-old preschool curriculum. My teachers use the CTELDS as guidance for curriculum and lesson plan guide, guidelines. So that's just a, um, a comment for folks. And that's amazing that you can do that, Heidi. Um, okay, we would need support to add on to our center to build a new classroom as you would not have any more space to enroll more children, and this will immensely limit the amount of spaces and centers. That's a comment, but let me ask, do you expect, I mean, all these things people are bringing up, do you expect that five years from now, all of this will be sorted out, kind of the, we'll be back on, on a, a schedule, it's almost like our schedule's off, because <laughs> um, we are on one schedule, we're switching to a new one, and five years from now, as all of these kids have cycled out, um, will these changes be, able to have been made so that we are sort of consistent with the nation and things feel more normal? Or do you think it's gonna take longer for this to get to a place of, of normalcy? Um, well, so I, think, I, think systems, I think systems adapt. So I, I do think people will adapt, um, but I still hope we have more children in preschool you know, than we do now. Uh, Cause 
it, it may adapt for most people. What we've got to make sure is this doesn't cause long-term educational impact on families who can't access preschool. That 29% of families that so many of us spend our days working to support uh, families that have high needs or who may not be able to access childcare because of transportation or cost. Uh, so that's a long-term thing, is that you'll have a third of each cohort that has access nothing for a whole additional year. Um, but I think a lot of it will settle out um, and some of it will depend on program policies. As I said, we're still encouraging programs that they um, can accept children at two years, nine months for preschool um, because we think the early years are super important and um, access to high quality early childhood matters. And we don't recommend waiting another year, um, but parents can wait another year if they don't want to pay for three years of preschool and programs that don't have space don't have space. Um, so I, I think it will settle down, Izzy, but I do think there's some long-term equity issues. I'm also curious if, you know, how the how the kindergarten curriculum change, you know, deve developmentally a four year old. Not, hopefully it doesn't become more like first grade. Exactly. I'm and I'm and I'm curious about that. I mean, that's an area where they we're also going to potentially need some advocacy is that we don't need kindergarten becoming more like first grade. I mean, kindergarten should have been becoming more like pre-K. Right. <laughs> Going the right. wrong direction and developmentally. I know. I know. Because I think you know, in kindergarten teachers' defense, a lot has been put on them um, without a developmental lens uh, because of concerns about tests in third grade. So now they have four and a half year olds and there are different expectations of the students. So I think that drives some of this. So I do want to defend them. Their kindergarten teachers are remarkable. They're doing amazing work. Um, so, uh, but, so the, I think they're feeling, you know, part of this is he is driven by changes in kindergarten curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to talk about mixed age group teaching for kindergarten teachers and preschool teachers that you can teach three, four and five year olds together. Even, I mean, I think we as a country have a mindset that is very grade driven and that's part of what drives the pre-K threes and fours is the education model in our country. Um, but there are plenty of models in other countries that have mixed age uh, throughout. Yeah, Joanne Kelleher and Cindy, a few others also in the chat uh, mentioning that the state legislator also, legislature also passed a bill about requiring play in kindergarten. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully this will help keep uh, kindergarten developmentally appropriate. Um, so a yeah. lot of folks uh, excited about that. Um, Cindy says we need to make the birth to five system work for all kids rather than require children to fit into the K to 12 system. Um, so yeah. 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 Um, another okay. um, approach though, I, someone says, I'm thankful that the school age change went through. My family moved from another state with an older start date. And as a former kindergarten teacher, I'm so thankful it passed. The way pushdown has affected kindergarten curriculum, it's not age or developmentally appropriate for the kiddos entering kindergarten at age four. They socially and emotionally struggle throughout their school career, um, which someone says the age change would be okay if all children were required to attend when they are age eligible. There will be families who it's register, again, so their right? child will not be the youngest, right? So, so this is also a redshirting question. Um, anyway, okay. Exactly. Let's see if there's anything. It looks like people are really, really wanting to talk about this, but let me see if there's anything else in here. Will the OEC allow for a change in licensed capacity to accommodate students needing to stay in preschool longer due to the kindergarten start date? Will we change the classroom capacity? It looks like that's what they're asking, a change in yeah. licensed capacity. Um, it's It's not... It's not in the licensing regs, which I'm going to talk to in a minute. The, the proposed licensing reg changes uh, do two things uh, that may be related. One is, you know, someone was just talking about a young threes classroom. One of the proposed changes is to go to one to five for two-year-olds. Um, another proposed change is to go to one to 12 for school-age care. Um, but none of those affect the preschool classroom size or ratio in preschool. But it's an interesting question. And, you know, I think it would be good if you had maybe a work group 
on the alliance, because I think folks listening can hear there are two problems. One, we have a short term sort of one year problem. You know, what should OEC consider doing to support programs for one year? Should we make some adaptations in the next legislative session to help deal with this short term problem? And the long, the longer term issues are ongoing professional development about you know, differentiation and teaching kids who are different ages in different classrooms. And also, you know, making sure the ELDS um, is appropriate. And I think it has enough banded, you know, space in it, but making sure our early learning standards work for up to five and a half now, not just four and a half. So, you know, those kinds of things we're really open to hearing from you all about. And, and maybe there's a way, you know, the Alliance could just have used part time on one of your calls to come up with those recommendations for us or things that we should be thinking about because our job now, this law has passed and you can hear the pros and cons on both sides. Um, we just have to help make it work for you all and make it work for the public schools and make it work. You know, we have to keep families at the center here too. Families are really, you know, our, our parent cabinet has weighed in, you know, that there's a lot of challenges in here for families because of the one year time frame. Yeah. Um, and so listen, folks, if there are some uh, comments in here that are for the community, I am uh, potentially not ask, uh, reading them out loud. So I just want you to know there is a lot in the Q&A that all of you can look at to read each other's comments. Yeah. Okay. Um, so say that. Um, who is the OEC lead on the kindergarten issue? Um, well, uh, Michelle Levy has been helping us, you know, work with SDE to get guidance out. But we haven't assigned a lead on the kindergarten issue. This this has sort of just happened. Um, but it's in our ECE team um, that's been sort of leading. Uh, okay, let's see. Can we get more information on school readiness programs getting a two and a half percent cost of living increase for their employees in the new state budget? How will this be distributed? Um, some of this is really complicated. When we get cost of living, that's why I prefer rate increases. When we get cost of living increases, there are always complicated rules about, is it for contracts? Is it for grants? Is it for nonprofits? Is it for schools? So we are working with OPM on the language there and it will be built into the payments um, like it has been in the past. But as I said, it's complicated, even which birth to three providers were getting it or not getting it. It's um, the cost of living. It all depends on the exact language in the bill and who is targeted. So I'm sorry, I don't have more information there, but I know our team is looking at that. Uh, is the state thinking about opening more state funded CDC centers in child care deserts? It seems that if the state would invest in brick and mortar buildings in certain areas of the state, it would be a win-win for families and businesses, i.e. electric boat. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback. And we are looking at all of these um, items with the Blue Ribbon panel uh, for sure. And we're trying to identify the child care deserts. Um, we are working with LISC on a facility fund. Um, and, you know, part of this, some of this is, you know, the the survey that we're working with um, United Way and uh, WBDC on is going to help with some of this. Um, but the we have just put out 1,300 new state-funded infant-toddler spaces, and I think you know I sort of think of it as a state-funded system. School readiness and CDC are the state-funded spaces, and we are so lucky in Connecticut to have those. Most states do not have that kind of state funded infrastructure and a lot of it's because of the advocacy of you all. Um, so we do see that as one strategy um, for expansion, um, but you know, we're, we're looking at how do you decide and you know, the Blue Ribbon panel's looking at all of that. And that, that would be the perfect thing. If I can just share, um, if I can just share this screen, it's the perfect thing for folks to send us feedback about and I'm going to ask Maggie if she's on. I think Maggie's on to put the link in the chat for feedback. But um, for those of you who's, who've been following along, uh, the Blue Ribbon panel is now uh, looking at systems. And one of the, 
for those many of you probably on here were on the call the other night, one of the recommendations of the systems group is to create a unified state funded system with easier administration, et cetera, and, and different payment mechanisms. Uh, so programs get funding up front and that kind of thing. So we are here right now in the systems deep dive and we have a panel meeting of the Blue Room panel on Wednesday. And we had the public hearing uh, last week uh, we got a lot of good feedback on that, on the systems. I think we had almost 100 people on the call giving us feedback on the initial recommendations. And, and all those items can be found on our website. So that panel meeting is happening um, this week. And then we move on to funding and costs, which is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, what are the recommendations going to be about funding and costs? Um, so there's a hearing about that August 3rd, and again, there's feedback, there are feedback, um, feedback forms on our website, and hopefully someone's put those in the chat. Yes, Maggie, you're so good. Um, she sent the feedback uh, form to everyone. Um, so these ideas like that are wonderful to send in to the Blue Ribbon panel around state-funded programs in child care deserts uh, for organizations like Electric Boat. Hey, I know you had some other things you wanted to cover. So let's take yep. a pause on the legislative update okay. and move on to the other things. And also, I did, forgot to ask you, what time is your, uh, what time do you uh, need? To well, I planned on 1030, but. Okay, let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, one is that um, Care for Kids has a delay going on in payments right now. Um, there were a, like it was a bad storm of things that happened between changing banks and then um, there was a, a sort of a data center meltdown and the combination uh, put us a week behind. So payments are coming out this week. For those of you that were expecting them last week, we apologize and the problem has been fixed and the payments are back online. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that and really apologize. I know you depend on that uh, to meet payroll, to meet mortgages, uh, all that kind of thing. So that that has been fixed. Um, the other thing I've been getting some questions about are uh, licensing. Uh, you know, we had public hearing, I think, last December. And um, now we have uh, the regulations are are. An, in another comment period, uh, because we made a couple of changes in them. So I just wanted to review what those changes were, and also um, say that that there is a there is a place to um, make those recommendations um, up until August first. There's an electronic submission form through the e regulations portal on the website of the Secretary of State or via email to our legal director, um, Cynthia Watts Elder. I might ask Maggie to put Cynthia's email in the chat as well. Um, and just put child care center regulations there on the subject line. Um, so it's been a it's been a long delay because of a couple other changes because we got a lot of feedback on particular issues that we wanted to make sure were addressed. And then because there were changes, they have to be out for comment again, which is the period we're in now. So those changes are, um, we, we've we been struggling as have many of you with what's the definition of a volunteer. And so the new regs uh, clarify what the definition of a volunteer, and, and that means any unpaid person who provides a service to the program um, and then non-program staff. That definition is clear to me. A person who does not provide direct care and does not have unsupervised access to children. So this could be someone doing a story time or doing music or dance, um, but there were a lot of questions uh, around that. Um, the other changes are around um, employment checks for staff 18 years of older um, that if you do when you do employment checks you need to make that information available to the office upon request 
Um, and then uh, there are some definitions around what is the physical plant, because there have been a lot of questions about spaces that are not within the licensed facility and playground. Um, so it clarifies that. And then um, fencing in of infant toddler spaces. And the other item is that school age, um, the ratio of program staff to school age children uh, moves from one to 10 to one to 12, and people can make recommend, can make comments about that. Um, so you can find this on our website and you can comment. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Um, We did not, uh, we had an initial comment period and then we had discussions um, and some we decided to move forward with rather than wait for a whole nother round of licensing changes because I know this all started when I started. So it's taken four years to get here. Um, because these aren't numerous changes or that substantive as the prior regs, um, we did not do a formal public hearing, but we are having a public comment period um, if we had uh, requests for a hearing, we would will happily do a hearing. Um, so, so you know, let us know. There is a formal process for requesting hearing. Um, so, if a certain if a certain number of people, I think it's if fifteen, ask for a public hearing, we we will have that. It will delay things further, but. You know, it's been years, so if, if that's to be, that's the rule. Um, otherwise, uh, we're taking comments till August 1st. OEC has to respond to every single comment um, that comes in, like sort of like the hearing process, and we will do that. Um, so then everything has to go back through the Attorney General's office and then over to the legislature for reg review process. Um, but we think some of these changes are are really important that are that we're wait, you know, most of them were way before these few things that I just mentioned. Um, but happy to answer questions. Uh, and um, I'm just looking to see. OK, since Maggie put Cynthia's email in the chat, if people want to send comments. Uh, Meryl said, let's see, question that came. I'm not sure. Meryl, let me call on you. I'm not sure. sure. It just it was a question that came in by email from somebody who was driving and knew she wasn't going to be able to yeah. answer the question. Um, it's a question about who should, how are regulations formed? Is it who proposes them? And then what's the process for approval? Yeah. Well, they're proposed by OEC and then often informed by, you know, our licensors are out there every day. So things that come up where it's hard to be clear Often they're clarifying issues. Um, other things come from the field, like we had a lot of input that people thought the two-year-old should be one to five, not one to four. So that is in the proposed regulations. Um, and the same thing happened during this last comment period when we were talking about infant toddler ratios. We got feedback that um, middle that school age should be one to 12. So we thought, okay, we'll add that and take comments on that because there might be opposition, there might be support. So that just depends on how, on the comments. And then we respond to every comment. We draft up the regulations based on the initial plus comments. And then um, the attorney general, you know, reviews them to make sure they're all sort of within the statutory, that they're appropriate, uh, constitutionally and statutorily, and then uh, they go to the legislature um, where there's another chance for people to weigh in you know, with legislators if they want, want them to change. But it is a long, long, long process. I think we do it like every eight years or so. So it goes to the regs review committee. They review it. Does it then need to go to the full legislature for approval or is the regs review committee able to do it on their own? I don't believe so, but I'm going to ask Maggie to weigh in. Maggie, can you weigh in? Does, this is the first time I've been through it as commissioner, which gives you a sense of how often it happens. I feel like I'm a commissioner a long time. I'm, I'm sorry, what is the question? Do the do the regulations just get voted on by reg review, or do they have to go to the full legislature? Right. I'm almost positive. Reg review. Okay. okay. 
And it's a long you, process. It is a long process. Is it possible for you to put a link to uh, these changes, the proposed regulations? Is there, does that exist? Yes, it does. That's, that's what I've been looking for, but um, it, it may, there may be a delay, and that's why I missed the question. Got um, it. Thank you. I tried to paste it, paste it in, but the link didn't go live in the yeah. chat. That's the problem. So if you want to email it to me, I can. Now, I'm going to I'm going to email oh, Izzy. I'll mail, email it right now to you. How's perfect. That? Yep. There perfect. Perfect. Uh, when would you if? if um, following the close of the comment period, when would you predict the regulations would go into effect? Uh, I would predict um, late winter. Okay. Um, we have, uh, there's still a bunch of comments on this um, that I, as I wrote in the chat, I am going to send all of the chat and questions to OEC so that they have them. So if okay. I don't ask the questions all live, um, folks can rest assured that they will get at least to you and your staff. Um, but people want to know about, you know, high school interns, um, where they fall in. There's there's some questions about these kinds of things. So, um, but I'll, I'll send you all of that. Okay. Um, and then let's see, stabilization fund question. Should we move to that or is that uh, sure. the direction? Sure. Do you um, want me to give an overview of what's happening? That'd be great. All right. Um, so uh, I think it was last week, uh, we have a final round of stabilization funding going out. And um, this, this is the end of the stabilization money. And these funds are being targeted at communities with an SVI of 0.8 or higher. And that is a community where the program is located. And I know like we have put out all kinds of funding that went to everyone. This, the last of the funds are targeted because we have some pretty good data that, um, well, we have accurate data based on our programs that the highest need communities are struggling the most um, with enrollment getting back to where it needs to be to be able to fund the program operations uh, for those programs. So I've been in there for full year programs in the highest need communities in Connecticut. That's how these funds are targeted. So I'm happy to take questions. And everyone, I just wanted to let you know, I just, I did find the news posts that we sent out last week. It's in the chat so that you can access the regs. Thank um, you, Matt. And Maggie, the thing that you sent me was about the kindergarten start age. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll, I'll see how, what, if I can share that. Um, yes, I sent, I sent a pasted copy of the Hartford Current story on page one, because I know a lot of people do not subscribe to the Hartford Current. And so then you can't, the link is, you can't access the story. Yep, I will. I will. I'll get to that in a second. So um, great. Round three of stabilization funds question. I've received feedback from the providers in my town who are upset that they aren't eligible for this funding because our town is just under the SVI cutoff. And they didn't know that until recently. They were counting on the funds. They point out that we are being discriminated against because of where we live. This is so unfair. And we all have worked so hard during the pandemic. And to say the least, we feel we are getting slapped. We all go to the same grocery stores, have the same electric, cable, utilities, but because certain providers don't live in a qualifying town, we aren't being considered. Can't this decision be changed? Or if there are additional funds, can they go to those who didn't get the round three funds? Well, I hear, I hear that anytime you have a cutoff, there's always... Um, people upset that they didn't qualify. And, you know, this is when, when it's more difficult. Um, I think more than almost any other state, we have targeted these funds to everyone, which, but it's been CARES funding to everyone, ARPA round one to everyone, ARPA round two to everyone, wage supports um, to everyone, um, and qualified workforce incentives to everyone. We're paying background checks uh, for everyone still at $85 a staff. We're paying accreditation fees for everyone. You know, we've done almost every single thing we've done has been for everyone. Um, but this last round of funding, it's clear to us um, that, provide, that the hot, highest need communities are struggling the most to hold on to programming. And um, we know that everybody still needs help, um, but we we use the data 
that we had uh, to make this decision. And um, certainly we're always looking for other sources of funds to help everyone. And we have, we've had grant programs at WBDC also open to everyone uh, for programs that are struggling to stay afloat. So uh, I know it's not popular with most people because the funding isn't going to most programs, it's going to the highest need programs. And uh, that was our decision, so. Commissioner, can I just add in one point? Sure. This is Elena Trueworthy. So the SBI is um, by census tract. So it goes all the way down to a census tract. So not um, just at the community level per se. So I just wanted to highlight that there are multiple census tracts or SBI levels within one community, for example. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ava or Meryl, do you have other questions that you would like to ask? There are so many in the Q and A. That, I know, uh, and I want to make yeah. sure we just I'll, prioritize. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. You, let you do your thing, Izzy. I saw one. Um, it's related to licensing changes, proposed licensing changes, where a program does a lot of outdoor stuff, and um, you know, like walking around in the woods behind the center kind of thing. The question yeah. is, that's not fenced space. Yeah. And, and how is it that a licensing uh, reg uh, licensing inspector is going to determine what's safe and not um, um and and uh yes and i think that's worth programs weighing in on uh with the licensing regs but i can tell you what what the plan is so it it says now indoor and outdoor space at the same address as the facility cannot be used for field trips unless the program can ensure the children's health and safety when using these spaces. Written permission must be obtained and parents guardians advise that the space is not inspected or approved by OEC. So that's sort of the clarification is that if they're gonna use space that isn't licensed by OEC, then they have to get written permission from the parents and tell the parents that the space is not inspected or approved by OEC. So that just makes it more clear than it was because there was a lot of back and forth about, and you know, those of you who know me know I ran school for young children and the woods were the most important part of our curriculum. So I've worked in programs uh, where this has been a key part of our sort of our educational environment. So it says indoor and outdoor spaces at the same address as a facility cannot be used for field trips unless the program can ensure the children's health and safety when using the space and get parent written parent permission and parents advise that the space is not inspected or approved by OEC. So I think that lays out a clear process if you're using spaces and that was the intention. Okay. Uh, Meryl, would you would you keep going with the questions for a minute? I've got um, something. I'll, I'll, I'll do. Okay. I'll do one while uh, I'll Go do one while looks. Uh, Velma so Alexander wanted to know if BIT provisions, uh, Commissioner, are going to continue. If there's going to be another round of IT space provisions. Um, I would say that um, the gear money is is done, which which was the the governor's. Um, money for uh, technology that we were using, the education technology funds. But this is part of why we're doing this survey and thinking about how we are supporting programs with technology going forward so we can make recommendations about the Blue Ribbon panel. Um, in terms of the existing funds and what's left, I'm just not sure I can um, find out. Um, I don't see anyone from OEC on the call who's been working on the gear project. So I'm sorry, I don't think I have the expertise to answer that. No worries. Uh, Marcy wants to know at what point uh, they'll be receiving a $3 raise for staff. I think that's already happening, right? And I, I believe we, I, I, I wouldn't say $3 raise for staff, but raises on certain subsidy programs happened a few weeks ago. Would you once more clarify on that? The, the Care for Kids changes, uh, I believe, went into effect uh, July 1st. That would be the beginning of the new fiscal year. 
Marcy, um, we hope that answers your, your right. question. If not, then please, uh, please clarify. Uh, I think, yeah, I think Marcy is from a Montessori school that has school readiness. Um, and oh, school, oh, school readiness. Yeah. Okay, school readiness um, changes. So that's 2025. So the, the 10,500 for full time, that's the change is in 2025. In 2024, we will continue with the enrollment grants uh, that have, were in place last year. Um, so that's, that's that change. Thank you, Meryl. Yeah. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are others here. Um, there have been a bunch of questions about um, the time it's taking for people to get uh, background checks and substitutes waiting for ever and they can't get you know five weeks and stuff yeah like that that doesn't sound right i believe them at that it's certain it's not it's not it's not not correct but we have not been getting a lot of feedback about background checks and people can weigh in and now say oh i'm giving you feedback um but I've also not. been getting feedback okay. about BCIS. Um, okay. I did about a week ago or two weeks ago, reach out to Charmaine and your team responded uh, so we can coordinate a call just on, on a retraining and discussion on that. Okay, all right, we will, we're will. we happy to do that. Um, but uh, I will check into that. And if someone can email me directly at beth.by at ct.gov, um, then I can... Um, I can look into that case and to Ava's part point, we'll, we'll work to see if there are any systemic issues. I know summer camps definitely add a sudden burst of people. So I wouldn't be surprised if things slow down a bit, but so it's always good for you all to wait, raise awareness for me. There was, uh, I don't know if you guys mentioned this, but just the comment that um, it would be helpful to have the language that's best to use for the not OEC approved like field trip locations. That kind of, so the language is tough for, it sounds like the language is hard to figure out how to do to do that. Did you already talk about that? I'm sorry that I had I to did. walk. I think basically the language is saying, it, you can't use space for field trip you can't call it a field trip on your property um, unless you can't use that space unless you alert parents. Um, they you can ensure their health and safety, and you have written permission from parents um, advising them that the space is not inspected or approved by OEC. Okay, great. So that's the basic. So it sort of gives programs a process to use that space. Um, Number one, assuring kids are safe. And number two, making sure they have parent permission for the kids using the space. Understood, thank you. So Marilyn, Ava, if I, I think the questions that remain are re redundant to some of the ones we've asked. Um, are, are you guys, um, is there anything that stands out to you that we need to ask before we let Commissioner By go? I've got a new one. I've got one, one last one, um, Commissioner, about... A month and a half ago, maybe two months ago, there was a discussion more internally of the possibility of opening the infant um, expansion grants. Uh, and I know that I talked to your team about, about it recently, and it's all tied up with funding. Any update on that whatsoever? Um, expansion? On the, the infant seats, the infant was the RFA. Well, those, um, we have we have filled those spaces. We have the providers who are providing those spaces yep. selected. Oh, you mean expanding further? Expanding further, correct. Oh, yeah, because um, you're already running the program. Would, it's going right. well, which is great. Yeah. So we're one, wondering, there would need if it's going to be, so well, are you gonna, are you gonna do it again? Well, <laughs> I, I do what I have appropriations to do. And uh, I think the Governor Lamont expanded state funded seats for the first time since, I don't know, 1990. I don't know, since school readiness started, it was a first big expansion of state funded seats. If it's going well, you know, you will want to let the governor and legislature know about that, especially if there's tremendous demand. And I think that's part of what the Blue Ribbon Panel is, is working on, um, is trying to look at demand and supply and, and how we can match those things. So I see two questions about um, career pipeline and internship kind of thing. Um, 
You said that there was two and a half million dollars to continue that. Is there? Yeah. So, so there's a couple things on that. That, that as part of this discussion, there's two and a half million assigned to the workforce pipeline programs, and we are interpreting that to mean the existing workforce pipeline programs that we're working that out. OEC still has six and a half million that many of you advocated for. Um, that we will be going out to, you know, with a more open uh, RFA or RFP process um, as once we clarify what's working in the pipeline programs, trying to expand that. Uh, for example, just as an example, um, there's some pretty good success going on uh, with programs working with high schools in Connecticut where kids are coming out with a CDA of high school and getting college credit. So uh, might there be a way that we can use some of that six and a half million to expand that and looking at other options. We're using some of, some of that funding for an SEIU apprenticeship program, which we're really excited about, see how that goes. But uh, so there's still additional funds available um, where we'll be wanting feedback once we were, we're, we basically got the final reports from the pipeline programs to see what's working, what's not, and how we can continue to expand the workforce. And so that we're, we're working on that. I don't have an answer of what that will look like, but so there's a, there's the money in the budget that was assigned to the workforce pipeline programs. And then there's still six and a half million for workforce development or apprentice like programs. So do you have any uh, sense of timeline on when there might be a RFA or RFP? Um, my, my sense of timeline would be late fall um, because we're, we have the reports in and we're sort of seeing what have been successful and we're talking to workforce boards and Department of Labor and um, trying to think through what, what's going to work best uh, to make the best investment with those dollars. Okay. Aaron, I just wanted to let you know in the chat, I put um, the OEC summary of the budget as it relates to early childhood and, the, and our agency budget, and then a summary of public acts recently passed related to early childhood. Okay. Um, and then there was a question about, uh, is there a possibility to provide funding for family child care providers to attain NAF, uh, NAFCC accreditation? Um, yeah, I'm going to make this the last question just because I'm, I'm a okay. bit late for my next thing, but that's okay. This is more important. Um, I'm sorry if I, if you're next, if you're listening on the call and I'm meeting with you next. Um, I, I believe we have a system set up. We're working with NAFCC, so we will be paying NAFCC accreditation fees. Yes. Okay. Well, um, thanks everybody. I appreciate your attention. I hope I was helpful. It's amazing that you have 250 people on this call. Other states just don't have this. So let me know if there are things we need to do better and uh, email me anytime at beth.by at ct.gov. Have a great day. Stay dry. Bye. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So thanks, guys. Um, I'm sorry that I missed one second there. <laughs> there's, there's like hectic stuff happening right here. This is the downside of working from home, right? <laughs> um, okay, so um, was there anything else that we needed to go over today? I would say another plug for Louise's WBDC survey. And so people don't forget to, I, I hate to ask you, Louise, but if you're, if you're able, if you could do another plug because we have newer people who weren't here in the very beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ava. So for those of you that missed it, WBDC in partnership with OEC and 211 has released a technology business needs survey. I will go ahead and put the link in the chat again. This survey, I know you guys do so, so many. It is a critical one. I won't lie. It is a long one. You can start it at one time. And as long as you're using the same browser, you can go back and finish it later on. Uh, so please do that in the next two weeks. It's going to ask about your business operations, your desired enrollment, and how you use technology in your business, including 
uh, child care management software if you have one or even if you don't. The survey is critical to helping inform the Blue Ribbon panel work and the decisions they're making that are going to affect all of you, as well as OEC's investments in technology for early childhood so that you can save time and money in your day-to-day -day operations. So I will go ahead and share that link, but please, please, please take the time out to do that survey. Great, thank you. <clears throat> all right, I think we're good to go then. Um, thank you all for being here today. We had almost 300 people on uh, this morning, so that's awesome. A uh, lot of good conversation, a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, we just can't get to everything, so um, just want to remind you all that I will send uh, questions and the chat to the Office of Early Childhood um, staff and Commissioner Bai uh, so that they at least have your comments. They know what you need. They know what you're saying. Uh, Ava. I just wanted to announce some of the topics that we do have confirmed. Um, so for, for those of you who are newer, uh, as you know, we always take in mind your, your suggestions on topic and matter, you know, the, the panelists who come on and the guests. So please do not forget to text, email us, or put in the chat any ideas uh, that you'd like us to cover. Uh, with that said, um, like I mentioned to the commissioner, there has been an influx of folks um, asking BCIS questions. So we did reach out to our team two weeks ago. They responded immediately. Uh, we are trying to just settle on a date for BCIS training. Um, the reason settling on a date is a little harder is because we have other topics that are already on the queue. So for next Monday, we have confirmation um, of an SCIU lobbyist who works on the federal um, uh, policies that are happening. He's going to give us updates on what's happening on the, the national level. I'm sure many of you have read articles on child care funding. And right now, the federal legislators are still in session. So they're, you know, they're trying to hash things out and figure things out. And it'd be really nice to hear how that might impact Connecticut. So that's John next Monday. The Monday after that, we are expecting Danny Livingston I'm still waiting for final confirmation from him. He said he's available any Monday, but he's a busy man, as we know. And then fully confirmed, triple confirmed, uh, July 31st, we have the Department of Public Health, Connecticut Department of Public Health. The commissioner will be on uh, with her team, some slides, conversation about air quality, uh, COVID and any other uh, viruses or health um, you know, concerns that providers might help have. Uh, this is a moment to be on to ask questions on July 31st. And then for the August, um, Meryl and I, uh, Meryl, you know, great ideas about making sure that we're having those conversations with legislators. So we're both reaching out to all of our federal delegation while they're in their summer recess. We have right now Johanna Hayes and Rosa Congresswoman Rosa DeLora's office uh, that returned um, our request. We just are trying to nail down, nail down some days. So hopefully for the month of August, every Monday we can have a federal legislator on uh, to talk to all of you. Um, and hopefully we'll be ready for not breaking Zoom because I remember when we had Rosa, we our capacity exceeded 500 and everyone was, uh, you know, on hold and we almost hit a thousand. So we all love Rosa. So be on the lookout for the emails and notifications on the agenda and panelist presentations happening the next few weeks. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ava. Um, okay. Thank you, um, Louise and Linda. Thank you, Commissioner Bai. Thank you to Sandra. Of course, Meryl, Ava, Liz, for always being our um, experts, uh, uh, resident experts every week. And, um, and of course, thank you to all of you for being here every week and making this important and making it happen. We wouldn't continue doing this if not uh, for all of you. So um, thank you so much, and we will see you next week. Thank you.